All right, so we're going to get started here in just a moment. Room is filling up. All right, so I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight, spending some time to learn about Ulster Savings Bank and the mortgage process and buying a home and all kinds of fun stuff we're going to go through tonight. I just want to cover a couple of kind of housekeeping things first. So these work best when there is some interaction with us and you, the, uh, the listeners and the viewers out there. So please don't hesitate to use the chat box. There should be a menu either across the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what type of service you're using. Um, and you'll see a chat box there. Just use the chat box to all. You don't have to put a name in, uh, but... Go ahead. If you have a question, chances are somebody else has the same one. We've done a couple of dozen of these types of webinars over the last six years, uh, probably getting up into the, uh, you know, somewhere around 15 or so. Um, and again, these really work best when people do ask the questions. We do tend to get the same questions repeatedly. So don't feel like it's a dumb question or it's something that you shouldn't ask. Now, if it's real, real specific to your situation, it has to do with your cousins, uncles, stepdaughter or something, you know, that's maybe something we're going to take offline. But for the most part, go ahead and throw your question there. Again, make sure you do it to all, not to me. I'm not monitoring the chat box. I have two of my associates on board with us tonight. We have Mike Zioli and Richard Hazy, who are going to be helping us with the Q&A. Those of you that are here in person, uh, when we stop to do, we'll, we'll stop about three, four times. Um, Rich is asking a question. I don't know if that's on purpose. Yeah, uh, could we try uh, uh, to put the uh, speaker on the uh, Al because it's it's uh, the unfortunately the blower came on and it's not it's hard to hear you. Uh, I don't think that. Let me. I'll move a little closer to the screen. Although anybody that's watching is not going to like that very much. Um, how about now? Is that any better? Uh, you got it. So. Speak a okay. little more. Bear with us. Technical difficulties here, folks. So um, if you go on to so I do the more, um, yeah. now go to your, um, where it's got the option to mute, hit that down arrow and you should see your audio settings. Make sure that your speaker is all the way up. So we can connect to the absent button. Okay. I'm going to make sure that's turned on. All right. Hold on. We're going to try and hook to the ebbs and see how that okay. sounds. All right. I will hold off for a moment here. So the other thing that will happen, just so you guys know, uh, as far as people coming into the room, that's a manual process. So I will have to stop as people continue to come into the room a little bit. I will have to stop and not stop, but uh, it may distract me a little bit. So just uh, don't you know, bear with me on that. Uh, hopefully in a minute, a couple of moments, uh, that will subside. How are we doing there live, Rich? I've got a, I've got actually a tech person here who's helping me out. <laughs> okay. So let me know when you think you're good to go. We may also need to connect to it. Bluetooth. Technical difficulties, please stand by. What's that thing called? It's an owl. The owl boost. Love it when a plan comes together. No, it's not showing up. Okay. Here we try the. Uh... Carolyn, you know when I told you I'd help you out with doing your, <laughs> your next one? I guess we could put a pin in that. I got hard wires and that one over there. So maybe do the small one. <laughs> How are we making out, guys? Almost there. 
investigation process. So, anybody know any good songs? Sorry for the delay, folks. We will get to everything, I promise. At the Epson over there, I think it is. So. All right. Why don't you keep going, Dave? Okay. All right. I'll I'll yell. We'll see if the my voice will last that that long. Okay. So um, okay. Sorry. Getting back to where we were. So again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we do have a lot of information to get through. We're going to go through at a pretty quick pace. Okay. You're going to see we do have slides that are going to help us along the way. Um, Take notes when you need to. I'll point out a few things specifically that I want you to take notes on. And again, use that chat box to give us any questions that you're looking for. We're gonna stop four or five times along the way. When you have a question, please, we do ask that you make it based off the topic that we're on. If it's something we haven't covered yet, just hold on to those questions because chances are we are going to cover them. Again, we've done this a bunch of times. We know the normal questions that come up uh, between Mike, Rich, myself on this call, we have somewhere around 400 years of experience. And uh, so we do know the general questions that are going to come up, especially with our first time home buyers. So that is, um, that's our basic program. You'll see the slides on the board. I'm going to be going over a lot of stuff verbally, and then we'll stop periodically for the questions. So please don't be shy. Okay. All right. And to start off with, I'm going to introduce a special guest that we have on with us tonight. Uh, her name is Carolyn Hurley. She is with Ulster County Habitat for Humanity. It's one of the local agencies that we do a lot of work with here at Ulster Savings Bank. And I want to welcome Carolyn. She's going to talk for a few moments about um, Ulster County Habitat and what they do, what they can do for you. Carolyn? Oh, great. Um, David, can, can you guys hear me okay? I hear you great. Perfect, perfect. I want to first thank um, you and Ulster Savings Bank for inviting me to speak at the beginning of your um, seminar here. I um, appreciate it very much. Um, I'm happy to share information about Ulster County Habitat for Humanity. So this slide is just a little bit about background and what we do here. So um, Habitat for Humanity International is um, is the overarching uh, um, uh nonprofit organization. They are active across 50 states in the US and, and globally as well. Their mission is a world where everyone, like it says, has a safe and affordable place to live. Here in Ulster, Ulster County, we take that and we believe that everyone deserves a safe, simple and affordable place to live. Here, what we do in our affiliate is we do um, new construction. Um, some affiliates will do rehab and a few other things, but currently right now we do new construction. Um, we've been building single family homes and um, we're gonna continue building single family homes, but we're also looking to start duplex models, townhouse models. Um, this way we can help more families of different sizes um, with, with a duplex. Um, so uh, we're excited about offering uh, that to some families going forward in the, in the new year too as well. So Dave, you can move on to the next slide if you like. Okay, okay our home, home ownership program. Our home ownership program is based on a few uh, criteria. One is the need for housing. And the need for housing is you can be living in substandard living, um, you could have structural issues, you could have leaky roof, you could have unsafe neighborhood, you could have 
no place for your children to play outside, but it also could be a financial need for housing, which means that more than 30% of your overall income is going towards your housing. The other is, um, part of our program is a willingness to partner with us, and that's our sweat equity volunteer program. And that is depending upon the family size, you'll donate, um, you will donate volunteer hours between 200 and 400 hours. Family and friends can help you with those hours. Those hours include being on the build site, building, uh, sometimes you start in somebody else's home and finish building on your home. It will include home buyer education classes um, and uh, helping in the restore as well. The goal of the willingness to work in partnership with us is we refer to Habitat partners, home, Habitat home buyers, Habitat partners. We're partnering together. And the goal of this is to be um, that we help you all the way through your closing and we hand out the keys and you are successful in your home and you know, you know everything about your home, taxes, everything, mortgage, all of that. So you, all of that is you learn all that within your sweat equity hours. The other is to ability to repay an affordable mortgage that is equal to 30% of your overall income. Okay, so every every qualified um, partner family does just purchase that habitat, ha, habitat house with a mortgage equal to 30%. All right, so um, with that, um, you, we look for individuals that have a reasonable debt a steady income that falls within 50 to 70% of the median area income for Ulster County. That number changes every year. Usually the new numbers come out in April or May. Those numbers are set by HUD. Um, so um, that, that does fluctuate from year to, that fluctuates from year to year. Um, uh, usually at this point, if I usually ask if you have any questions, but uh, well, we can go on to the next slide. Okay, how do I apply? So you're interested in our program. How do I apply? It's very easy. You can uh, you request a homeownership application by mail or email. You can also download it at our website. I put the website number there, uh, the, the web address there. Additionally, um, you, can, um, you can actually just give me a call. I have my contact information at the, um, the end of the slide. Um, you complete the application and you submit it along with the requested uh, financial documentations. And here are a few uh, that I have listed here. We look for, we're looking for eight weeks of the most current pay stubs for everybody over 18, um, earning an income that will be living in the Habitat home. Copies only, we look for the most recent two year tax returns with W-2s and award letters of SSD, SS, SSD benefit, SSI benefits, child support, foster care, dependent care, housing voucher. We do look at all of that as income coming into the home um, too. So um, you would just submit copies of those supporting document, financial documentations along with your completed application. Um, you wanna go to the next slide? All right, so what happens, so then after that, I evaluate it. Once an application is complete, we will evaluate it. We'll evaluate it. We look at the need for housing. We look at the willingness to partner. We can evaluate the willingness to partner very early in the process. Um, and then I, 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 the ability to repay affordable mortgage. So I look at all that. If your preliminary criteria is met, I will reach out, to, I'll give you a call to come in to meet with me and we will talk about um, what financial uh, institution or more, you know, you'll contact a financial institution of your choice, um, but we'll discuss what's available out there. We'll discuss, um, we're talking about affordable, we'll discuss Sunny May loans uh, available, USDA loans. We'll have a conversation about what loan products are available and where they're available in the county and how to reach out to, to that too as well, to those organizations and banks and institutions. Um, and you, what you're doing, you're looking for a pre-qualification at the time. If you, if, if the applicant receives a pre-qualification with a mortgage equal to 30% of your overall income, you'll reach back out to me. And then the next step is a home visit. And then after the home visit, then we, it goes every application is presented the board makes the final decision all they want to know is there a need for housing is there a willingness to work in partnership with us and is there ability to repay an affordable mortgage how long does this process take 
The process uh, can take, it varies. Um, the application process, actually applying to getting uh, a, a value, you know, a response, it can take anywhere from one to three months because sometimes it, 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 it's waiting for that complete application. Sometimes there's bits and pieces that need to still come in uh, as, as applicants are gathering in for their financial inf information. If they're approved for partnership, it can be anywhere from nine months to 18, 24 months until you're actually in your home. There are for reasons that there's that sweat equity component, there's construction schedules, but additionally, some affiliates, they will actually um, open an application season and close an application season where we actually always keep our application uh, season. We open, it's never closed. So you can apply, be accepted in the program, but there are actually other um, partner families ahead of you and we're working through as we, you know, get working into the homes and everything. Also, um, I do want to touch base on here too. That so you may say, okay, what happens after I apply? What if I'm not approved? Um, you, it is never a one and done with Habitat. So when you contact, when you're, when I evaluate your application for whatever the reason is, um, you always, you'll always have a reason. We will sit, we will talk, we'll have a conversation about what it was, the reason. It could be credits that has to be worked on. It could be length of employment needs to be worked on. It could be a little under income. It could be over income, but yet those numbers are going to be changing again next year. So we have that conversation. Um, so every applicant knows because we get many repeat applications. And so it's never a one and done application with, with Ulster County Habitat for Humanity. Um, and you're never just going to get a, a information that, oh, sorry, your application was denied. You're going to know why it was denied. And we're going to have a, we'll have that conversation to see if there's steps going forward. Because we do have a couple other programs too as available for, for families to get them on the uh, path to home ownership with us if they're not even qualified at that moment. Um, so we have that as well. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. All right, so I just want to show you guys a couple photos and our and what we're what our future looks like here at Ulster Habitat. So these two photos um, that you see right now, we do have families in them. Um, so to get an idea of what we're building, the homes that we build, um, and we are we're building two more homes with this very similar style currently right now and then we are moving on to what you're seeing below that is our first ever habitat development in ulster county we're very very excited for this development to start um we are we're very close we're, we've got preliminary approval we're moving ahead we are building the roads we are putting in the septic the sewer the lines the electric clearing it out and then turning it and in addition to building the homes and then turning it over to the town of Saugerties. This is in Saugerties. We're very excited. As you can see, there's 10 lots, buildable lots, and a couple of those we hope to be duplex models. So we're very, very excited about this. And we hope to begin to break ground probably in the, um, probably in, in the late, in early spring which is coming pretty quick. So early to mid spring. Very excited about that. Excellent. So, um, okay, so this next, I usually ask so many questions at this time, um, but I just wanna, here's my contact information. If you would like to put it down, um, write it down. Here's my, my contact. I do have some upcoming home buyer info sessions coming up um, and which will go into more depth answer any of your questions. Um, there's one coming up on March 13th at the Saugerties Public Library. You can go to our website, Ulster County, um, Ulster Habitat, sorry, .org, www.ulsterhabitat.org, and you can go to own a home, and then you can sign up. There's a link to sign up on that. Also, there's a link in our social media if you want to follow us as well. You also can email me. And we do, we'll have a couple virtual uh, sessions as well and if anybody is um a veteran that is on this call we do have one I, it got scheduled after i sent this to you to uh the slides forward it will be in uh april 17th um in Saugerties. um but i there will there'll be information P please um please check our website give me a call 
Um, you don't have to also wait for these uh, home buyer info sessions to, to speak to me. Uh, it's nice to have the opportunity to speak to a group, but you can always call me anytime, ask about our program in more depth and even request an application. So um, it's been very nice. Uh, I guess um, I don't know if there's any, I don't see that there are any questions, but please, uh, you, you, I see that a hand is raised, David. Yeah, um, I don't know. That's been up for a while. Okay. Um, so I'll just I'll just remind everybody if you if you want to ask a question, just go ahead and put it into the chat box. You can type it in there. Um, ask that you do keep it on point in terms of what we're talking about. So if anybody has any questions about Habitat for Humanity or Ulster County Habitat for Humanity for Carolyn, uh, now's a good time to go ahead and put it in there. I don't see anything related for uh, your purposes there. If anything does come in as we go along, obviously we will look to answer that either through Carolyn tonight or I can always get the question to Carolyn afterwards and we can respond to you that way. Uh, a lot of those, a lot of the questions that'll come up probably between uh, myself and Rich, we could answer anyway, yeah. and if it's, uh, and we'll get them in, in touch with you. So, okay, um, yeah, I really appreciate you taking some time out with us here tonight. And uh, this is a great program, folks. If it's something, if you are looking in Ulster County, this is a great agency that we partner with, and uh, you know we'd love to partner you guys up with that. Uh, bear with me. It looks like we might have a live question. Yep. Yes, yes, we did, Dave, for Carolyn. Uh, they wanted to know where the location of that subdivision is in Sorgates. Well, um, it's actually, it's uh, we, we refer to it as Jeffrey Port. So it's what it is. It's off of Jeffrey Port um, in Sorgates, which is uh, actually, it's not too far from where we're currently building right now. It's not too far from where 32 and 9W come together. It's actually not too far. So it's in that area. You kind of go down just a little bit, make a right, and then another right. It's down. It's But it's in that general area. It's kind of still close to Glasgow, where we're currently building. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, that's very exciting. That's a first for our area. I don't think yeah. any, because we do work with the, the habitats from the other areas around here as well, in Dutchess and Orange County. Um, and I don't think I've seen anything like that uh, as of yet. No, we're, we're, cool. we, we are really, really excited about it um, too as well and, and to get to get moving on that pretty soon. So okay. um, yes, and to get as many families in there as soon as possible too. Right, right. <laughs> so. okay. And we, like I said, we do work with uh, Ulster Habitat very often. So if you're looking to get pre-qualified, we're happy to help you with that. So thank you very much, Carolyn. We're going to go ahead and... Um, so somebody just asked about Carolyn's contact information. You should still see it on your screen. Yep. And I will give it out again at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation. All right. Thank you so much. Again, thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Move on here. All right, guys. We are gonna kick into gear and hopefully no more uh, technical difficulties. All right. So just want to talk real brief about Ulster Savings Bank itself. As you see on the screen here, you're going to see a lot of information on the screen. I'm not going to sit here and read everything to you. That's no fun. Um, but again, I want to remind you, if you do have questions, please just throw it in the chat box and we will stop a couple of times along the way. So what you see out there is we are a community bank. That means that we are responsible to the people that bank with us and the areas that we service. That is Ulster, Dutchess, and Orange Counties. We can lend anywhere in New York State except for the five boroughs. So if you're looking to get a second home upstate or you're looking to buy, you're moving down south to Long Island or whatnot, we can handle those deals. We do them all the time. Uh, we just don't have specific offices there, and we do not uh, lend in the five boroughs. There's uh, different regulatory reasons for that, uh, just a different animal. So just want to go through that. Um, and then you see, we do believe in giving back to the community. In the last 25 years, we've donated over $15 million and just thousands of man hours to our local charities. I do want to point out that we are a full service bank. So as you see across the top, anything financial that basically you're looking for, we can help you with that. And everything from uh, tax, it's getting unfortunately into tax time. We have a full tax preparation department, investments. We have financial advisors on board, obviously regular banking, checking, saving, CDs, that kind of stuff. Loans, which is what we specialize here and we're going to talk an awful lot about tonight. And insurance. We have a full service insurance department here as well. Can help you with your, how, uh, obviously your homeowner's insurance, auto insurance, life, 
uh, workers comp, whatever you need. We uh, basically try to be full service to our community. All right. So gonna jump right in here, try to accelerate this a little bit. Uh, what are the four C's of mortgage lending? We talk about the four C's of mortgage lending. So we have the first is capital. That is the money that's going to be used. That's the money that you're going to have to put in to actually get this deal done. That's your capital, excuse me, capacity. That has to do with how are you going to pay back the loan? What are we going to judge for the most part? What are we going to judge whether or not you can repay us after we grant you the loan? It's by looking at what is your capacity uh, to borrow. The credit all scary. Uh, we're going to pull a credit report. We're going to get into a lot of information with that. And then collateral, that's the home that you're buying. Whatever type of home that may be, that's your collateral for the loan. Okay. So we're going to get into each one of these in, in a lot of detail here. So, so the first C, capital, what do you need money for on your end? Well, um, there's a bunch of things. So down payment, closing costs, escrow and reserves. How much do I need? That's the big question everybody asks. Well, I'm going to give you an answer now, and you're going to hear me say this many, many times tonight. My team hates it because I use this word all the time. Depends. It depends. Everybody's situation is a little different. What's right for you may not be right for your neighbor, your uncle, your father, what have you. Okay, so one of the important things you're going to hear me talk about is that we're going to work up a custom quote. Everything we're going to do has to be custom to you, not just a blanket. Everybody gets the same thing because everybody's situation is a little different. And that has to do with, again, so down payment. How much money do I need to put down? Well, some people put down 50% of their purchase price. Some people put down 20%. We can go as low as 5% down. We can go as low as 3% down. We even have some programs where we're essentially doing 100% financing, okay? You still need to have some money into the transaction uh, in terms of, you'll see the other things we're gonna talk about, closing costs and whatnot, but we may be able to do 100% financing. A lot of those special kind of programs do have limitations on them. We'll talk a little bit about this as we go along, but the uh, such as, Geographically, certain programs are only available in certain areas. Uh, we also have income limits, okay? And different areas will have different income limits. So Ulster County's income limit might be different than Orange County, might be different than Dutchess County, okay? What are those limits? Depends. The different programs have different limits. Unfortunately, they don't all use the same scale, basically. So we are going to look to uh, put you in whatever program works best for you. Um, but one of those, so one of your costs that upfront may be down payment. Uh, the second thing you see on there, closing costs. Okay. How much do I need for closing costs? Anybody want to guess? Depends. Okay. Different programs have different requirements. Different programs have different costs. Uh, different people, depending on your credit score, depending on how much you're putting down, that can affect your closing costs. It's one of the things that drives me crazy when I read articles online about, oh, make sure you have X number of dollars set aside for closing costs or X percent of your purchase price. These numbers are going to change depending on your situation. Uh, one thing I can tell you, uh, if you're ever looking at any type of a national article on closing costs, you can kind of uh, bump that up a little bit because New York, in case you didn't know, one of the more expensive states to live in, closing costs is no different. Uh, I'll give you, for instance, one of the biggest costs that we have is a mortgage tax. Okay. We're one of only six states in the country that have a mortgage tax. Yay, New York. Uh, so you have to take that into account. So if you're looking at an article, they may be referring to something in Virginia who doesn't have a mortgage tax. So there could be a wild difference in the amount that you're going to have to have. So it's something that we can't just give you a blanket, oh, it's going to be about this much or about this percent because everything everything changes based on your situation. Some of the costs are going to be basically fixed. Credit report is going to cost the same regardless of whether you're buying a $50,000 house or a $500,000 house. The credit report is going to cost you the same. The appraisal is probably going to cost you the same. Okay. Then there's other things like the mortgage tax. That's a percentage of the mortgage that we're taking out. You have something called title insurance. That's going to be a percentage based off the sales price. So there are these things, obviously, as the more expensive house that you're going up on your purchase price and your loan amount, your costs are going to go up as well, okay, on most things. Some things are fixed. Some things go up on skip, okay? Uh, the next item on our list is escrow. So I like to go into this a little bit. So the term escrow is used a few different ways. If you've ever heard that used in any type of TV show or movies, people say we're going to escrow. Uh, that's not what we do here in New York. That's a geographic thing. So in California, 
uh, if you're going to escrow, basically that means you're closing on your house. That means that you're you're going to sign your documents. What we refer to when we talk about escrow is money that's set aside for your uh, property taxes and your homeowner's insurance. All right, how much do you need for that? Depends, okay? Um, what we do is we give you a rough idea of what it might be and to keep everything fair and equitable, we're going to give everybody the same numbers up front unless you already have a house in mind. So if you have a house and you say, all right, I'm looking to buy 123 Jones Street in Poquay, okay, well, we can look at, up the taxes on that property and we can give you the numbers off of that property. If you're just saying, hey, I want to know how much I qualify for, well, then we're going to use 7500 a year for your property taxes. Now, obviously, depending on where you're buying and how much how much of a property you're buying, that number could be ridiculously low. It could be ridiculously high or it could be pretty close. But we have to have a number to start with. So that's what we're going to do. Once you find a house we're interested in, then we can tailor it to that. Again, getting your custom quote ready. OK, homeowners insurance, we're going to use one hundred dollars a month. OK, uh, or I'm sorry, we're going to use the thousand dollars a year. That's what we're going to use. Works out to be eighty three dollars a month. So uh, we're going to use a thousand dollars a year. Homeowner's insurance doesn't vary anywhere near as wildly as your property taxes might. So that is a good general idea. And then there's other things that you might need in there. If you're in a flood zone, you might need flood insurance. That can be very expensive, generally more expensive than homeowner's insurance. OK, so but that's something we wouldn't know until you really start to pin yourself down and, and what house that you're looking for. That's very specific. Um, and that's something that we won't know until we really move along with the process unless the seller discloses that which very few do uh, because they don't want to scare anybody off. So unfortunately, that's just the nature of the beast. So um, I didn't do my background. I usually give a little bit of background myself, but in the interest of time, because we got held up in the beginning, I didn't want to do that. But just so you know, I've been doing this over 30 years at this point. So we do, you know, I have seen all different types of things. So I am speaking directly from experience when I tell any type of story or any type of uh, example that I give. It is generally from my experience or somebody on my team. Okay. Okay. Um, the last topic that you see there in reserves, how much you're going to need for reserves, it depends. Uh, there's programs where you don't need anything. And so just to give you a definition, so reserves essentially is after you close on the house, you sign all your paperwork, the keys get slid across the table to you, and you're walking out of that room. What do you have left in your bank accounts? That's your reserves. We have programs where you're not required to have anything. OK, say that again. There's programs where you're not required to have anything left over in your bank account when you close. That's kind of a scary proposition, but it's up to you. That's something that uh, that if you're comfortable with that, so be it. Uh, there are other programs that will require it. Generally, if you start getting into uh, more involved uh how home types, something like if you're doing a multifamily home, if you're buying a two unit or three unit, something like that, generally that's where the reserves really start to come in. Or if you're buying multiple houses, you're, this is your fourth house that you're buying, you have a couple of rental properties, that's where reserves will come in. A lot of your basic deals, we don't necessarily require reserves, but there are some programs that do require them. And some of the programs that we use, we use an automated underwriting system. So basically, we punch all the information in, and it kicks back to us a result whether or not um, it likes the deal or not. There are times where it may not like the deal based off the initial entry, but then if we say, oh, hey, I've got 10 months of reserves, and we put that in, now the computer might like that. So we just never know. It's one of the things I'm going to talk to you about over and over again tonight is being upfront and honest with your uh, your contact person. I'm going to use a, a couple different names, loan originator, mortgage specialist, uh, uh, loan professional, what have you. When you're talking to your rep from Ulster Savings Bank and going through your information, just be open and honest about what you have available because whether or not you want to use it or not, and I'll give the example of like a, uh, and we're going to get into this a little bit down the line. Uh, you may not want to use your retirement fund and I get that. But just having it might be the difference between you being able to get approved or not, even if we're not going to use it. So just kind of keep that in mind as we move along. All right. So where does all this money come from? Well, many different sources. So you'll see on here, personal funds. So that's things like your regular basic checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs, uh, could be money market accounts, anything like that. Anything that's your funds, that's, that's what I call under personal funds. Second topic there, you see gifts. So gifts, very uh, for the most part, fully accepted. Most programs will allow gifts. Now, who can give you a gift? That will change depending on the program that you're going into. 
Uh, it generally has to be some kind of a family member or very, very close friend. Uh, how do we prove that? We don't, we're not pulling DNA tests or anything like that on you. So, uh, but generally it has to be listed as a family member. We have a form letter that you, that you and the, the, the donor fill out and sign, and then we have to see the gift transfer. But generally most programs do allow gifts. Uh, seller concession. So this is something that can get a little tricky. Even people that have been in the business for a while sometimes get hung up with this. Uh, generally your, your realtors and your attorneys We'll say don't always get this uh, perfectly straight either. So that's based off my experience. So basically what that means is that the seller agrees to pay some of your closing costs. Okay, I'll say that again. The seller can pay some of your closing costs. Now there's limits on how much they can pay. And that depends on the program and what you're doing. If you're doing 3% down, generally that's going to be less than if you're putting 10% down. Uh, but the seller can pay, say, somewhere between 3 and 6% of your uh, of the loan amount of the purchase price in closing costs. So if you're doing a $300,000 price, you can have, if you're in a program that allows a 3% seller concession, they could give you up to $9,000 to pay for your closing costs. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to. That means that they can, okay? It still costs them money to do so. Uh, there's ways to work it out. It's perfectly legal. It's done all the time. We're not you know, doing any magic math with it. Uh, but that is an option. So it's something if you qualify for the size home that you want and the size mortgage that you want, but you're a little light on assets in order to qualify, then that's something that uh, we may want to look into doing. OK, um, but again, it is up to the seller whether they want to agree to do that. Uh, the next one is nonprofit grants and DPAL. You don't have to write this down, but DPAL stands, stands for down payment assistance loan. OK, so down payment assistance loan, again, you don't have to write that down, but there are certain programs that have something like that or nonprofit grants. So we work with a lot of the uh, housing agencies in the area. So the bulk of our work obviously is done in Ulster, Dutchess and Orange County. There are um, some main agencies that we work with there here in Ulster County. It is an agency called Rupco. There's Hudson River Housing in Dutchess and Pathstone that primarily is in Orange County. And there is some overlap between these. There's also, there's agencies in Greene County, whatever. If you're looking to buy outside of the, uh, the, the, the main area that we service, I would just recommend going and uh, you can just do a, an, an internet search for housing agency in whatever, Delaware County, Greene County, Rockland County, wherever you're looking to buy, housing agencies in Rockland County, you do a search for that and it should come up. Um, and they may have something available that could help you out in terms of your money available for down payment and closing costs. We do not necessarily keep track of all these. The reason being is because, like I said, we cover all of New York State. There's no way we're going to be able to keep up to date on everything because they do change from time to time. Some grants are kind of evergreen and they're around all the time. Other grants are a specific amount of money that gets awarded. And when it's gone, it's gone and it's done. And that might be yearly. They get a certain amount or it might be a one time thing. So we don't necessarily keep track of all that stuff. That's not something I would expect your, uh, your mortgage specialist to be able to give you a ton of direction with other than, hey, why don't you reach out to this agency in your area, okay? The next program, uh, Ulster Savings Bank, the Home Buyer Dream Program. So this is a grant program that we participate in and we actually arrange for you. So this is something that has been around for, uh, in its current form, about four years now and four or five years. And what it is, is we have uh, a certain number of slots of up to $20,000 in grant money that can go towards down payment and closing costs for you that can be used for your loan. So there are income limitations on this. There's no geographic limitation. It's anywhere in New York. So it's just anywhere that we lend. So not the five boroughs, uh, but there are income limits and those income limits do change by county. Um, and that, um, depending on what your situation is, like I said, we can get you upwards of $20,000 to go towards your down payment and closing costs. So it's a great program. We have, I think this year we were awarded 11 slots initially, and uh, that just came live uh, within the last couple of weeks. So as of right now, we still have some slots available, but that is just a first come first serve situation. And we can't reserve it for you until basically you're ready to go. You have to be ready to go with a signed contract. OK, so if it's something that you're interested in, like I said, make sure you discuss that with your mortgage specialist up front so that uh, we make sure that we can look and see if it is available to you. If you do qualify for it, 
and how that may help you to uh, to be able to afford the house that you're looking to buy. Okay. The last uh, topic that you see on there, I'm very, very proud of called Housing Development Fund. So this is something I won't say it's exclusive to Ulster County, but it is, uh, there are only five banks in all of New York State that have that available to them. And we're basically the only one in this general area that we work in. Again, Duchess Ulster and uh, Orange Counties, we're about the only ones that even have this available. What this is, is you would take out a regular, quote unquote, regular first mortgage, the Housing Development Fund, it's a, it's a non-for-profit agency, it's out of Connecticut that we work with, uh, they will provide a 20% down payment loan. Okay, so now this is not a grant, it is a loan, there will be a repayment. But if any of you have been shopping around with where mortgage rates are right now, you know that we're upwards in the high sixes, seven, somewhere around there right now. This program allows for a up to a 20% um, down payment at 3% fixed interest rate, okay? So when regular rates are going somewhere in the high sixes, 7%, that's real, real appealing. Now, again, there's limitations. There's some geographic limitations. There's income limitations. Uh, some of the income limitations do also depend on how many people are going to be living in the house. So if you're solo, that's you'll have one limit. If you have a family of six, that's a different limit. Um, so there are some different things in there that go in that. I don't I, I can't go into great detail on it in this environment because not everybody's going to qualify for it. But I want to bring it to your attention again. That is something. So, again, if you can qualify from a uh, income standpoint, but you, you're, you're a little short cash to close. That's a tool that we have in our toolbox here at Ulster Savings that you're really just not going to find out there very much. All right. So I'm very, very proud of that. And with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask my partners here, Mike and Rich, to unmute. And let's go, Mike, first. Do we have anything in our online chat box, any questions about capital or anything that we've talked about already? Yeah, there's two questions, Dave. Uh, first, watching this SIP webinar can save you $750 if you purchase a home within two years. Yeah. So yes, um, we'll give the information out at the end of the seminar on how you can get that. We will issue a certificate. The certificate will say that it is good through December 31st, 2025. Yeah, 2025 right now. Um, and if it takes a little longer, we'll probably work with you on that. But yes, as of right now, uh, they're set to expire December 31st. You would have to close on your home by December 31st, 2025. The next question is, is the New York state mortgage tax a standard rate or does that vary depending on county? My favorite answer. It depends. So yes, <laughs> it does go by county. Generally speaking, the further north you go, the lower it is. So Westchester is higher than Dutchess, which is higher than uh, Columbia Green County. Uh, but then you start getting up into Albany County. I think it goes up again. So yeah, it does. It does depend on where we are. Um, but it's and it's. You know, it's just something me having lend, been doing lending in New York for as long as I, I have, it's, it's uh, you know, the, its impact is kind of lessened on me. But as, for you guys as uh, as new home buyers, some, um, it, it's an impact. And again, it's something when you uh, start talking to your mortgage professional and you talk to them, that's something they're going to give you a list of proposed uh, closing costs. And that, that'll be part of it. We don't separate out. Oh, well, this isn't really a closing cost. There's bank closing costs and there's third parties. It, it all doesn't matter. It, it all gets lumped together. Okay. Uh, Rich, we got anything from our live crowd? Anybody here have a question regarding this part so far? Do do land loans. Uh, it, so the question is, do we do land loans? Yes, we do. We will get into that a little bit later. Um, some, A lot of things we're going to talk about tonight don't necessarily apply because that's different. That's not because it's just land and there's no house on it. That doesn't more than likely not going to qualify you for any of these types of special programs that we talk about, but we do them here. There's not a lot of banks left that do them. So uh, yeah, we, we do quite a bit of it. Okay. Anything else in the live crew? What else? No. Any questions? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, speak Spanish here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
How much money does he have to have for the down payment and closing costs? That capital will it will I'm going to answer that for him, David, because uh, it's a translation. But I can have uh, someone at the bank who speaks Spanish. We could set up a phone call, and she does translation, so we could have that conversation offline, and she can we can go over that with you. So when we leave, I'll give you my contact information, and then you can I can set up the, with uh, Diana. She'll give you we'll give a call, and we'll do a joint call, and she can answer that for you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's one of those custom quote things. It's going to be different for everybody on the call, I'm sure. So. All right, let's uh, go ahead. Oh, Mike's back. Mike's back. All right, what do you got, Mike? We have one more in the chat real quick. Uh, it says the fixed 3% in this market at the high sixes. Can you cover that again? How is that possible? It's a special program that we have available to us. So it is only for the down payment part. So uh, you can get, so again, if you're buying a $300,000 home, you could get $60,000 as a down payment, 20% of the purchase price. And that'll be set up on a fixed rate at 3% over 20 years. So the payment on that obviously would be much lower than if you were at you know your six months. So the, your, the rest of the loan, the rest of the purchase price will be whatever monies you put in, plus your quote unquote regular first mortgage. That'll be at whatever our going rate is at the time. Okay, so again, that's something if you're interested in it, just uh, you'll speak to your mortgage specialist when we uh, when we get to that. Okay, um, when you when you talk to them on a one on one. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and move on. We'll again, if if we have time at the end, we'll stay we'll stick around for some additional questions. But uh, I want to go ahead and keep us moving here on to our next topic. So the second C capacity. So this is again, this is. How are we judging that you're going to be able to afford this house? So what are we looking at generally? We're looking at your income sources. What is your current income? How is it derived? Uh, what is the history of the income? Is it, is it something that's stable that you've been getting for years? Is it something that's brand new? These are all things that we're going to talk about. So um, basically, to, to start off with, almost any kind of income that you're getting is something that we can use if you if it's stable if you have a history of getting it, if, you know, there's a lot of ifs and there's a lot of depends on this. So uh, for instance, the uh, we'll go with the kind of the, the two uh, ends of the spectrum. I like to use as examples, you're a teacher, you have a salary. Great, no problem. We're going to take your salary, we're going to divide it by 12 and that's going to be your, your qualifying income. You're self-employed. We're going to have to take a look at your tax returns. Generally, we're going to look at two years of tax returns and we're going to average out what your income is from there. There's a whole formula that we're going to use in order to do this. It's not going to be your gross pay, and it's not necessarily going to be your net pay. It's going to be somewhere in between. There's certain right things that you write off as a self-employed business owner that we can add back in. There's other things that we can't. Okay, so I've seen people that have claimed a million dollars in income, and we could only use twenty thousand a year in actual usable income because they're writing off all their expenses and whatnot. So it's one of those things where whatever you're telling Uncle Sam on your tax returns, that's what we're going to help. That's part of what we're going to use to help qualify. Okay. Um, other sources could be things like Social Security, uh, VA, pension, things like that. Fine. No problem. So fixed income, not an issue. Uh, certain things you have to have a history of. Like I said, when it comes to self-employed, hey, I just started my business eight months ago. Well, that's not enough time to elapse when it's something that's variable income. We're going to be looking generally for a two-year history of any type of variable income. So you're a commission, you're making a lot of overtime, you, uh, you make bonuses, your hours fluctuate, you're an hourly employee, but your hours fluctuate every week or every two weeks or whatnot. We need to have a history of that in order to adequately um, qualify you and get you ready for loan because we, we never want to qualify off your best month because every other month, if it's worse, then obviously we don't want to put you in a position to fail. We never want to set you up to fail. And there are also federal guidelines that we have to follow when it comes to that kind of thing. So we are going to be looking at the history and stability. Now, you just graduated in December from college. You got your first job and it's a salaried position. We don't really need a history. OK, if you have an offer letter and it says you're going to be making sixty five thousand dollars a year, then we're going to be good with that because it's salary. Salary doesn't fluctuate. Anything that fluctuates, we need to get, we're going to need to see a history of. Okay, I hope that makes sense. 
Um, and the same thing with the stability. Like I said, you have one great month and you think, okay, that's the month I'm gonna apply because you're commissioned and you just sold the most widgets that you've ever sold. That in itself is not really gonna do it. We're gonna look at that over a time period, a year to two years generally, and look and say, okay, what's the average income that this person is making? That's what we're gonna wanna use to qualify, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so in terms of your, your income sources, like I said, if you're on a fixed income, uh, some kind of like a retirement, a VA, that type of thing, that's not necessarily a problem. Rental income, you have rental income. Again, it's not going to be the top line number. It's probably not going to be the bottom line number. It's going to be somewhere in between. We have a formula that we use and we're going to come up with a number. Um, so that's something that you just, you know, your best bet is to disclose everything up front, get us your paperwork so that we can work those numbers up for you do the work for you. So we're doing something that really, really works for you. Okay. That's the best advice I can give on that. Okay. So we talk about capacity. We're worried about you being able to make your house payment. What does that include? Well, there's a number of different things there that that's going to include. So your principal and interest, that's your basic mortgage payment, right? We're going to pay principal and interest every month. And then we're talking about your property taxes, your insurance, <clears throat> excuse me, your property taxes and your homeowner's insurance and flood insurance, if you have it, uh, mortgage insurance, if you have it, those four things are all part of everybody's mortgage payment generally. So we don't have to escrow for taxes and insurance. I highly recommend it, especially if you've never owned a home before. Uh, property taxes in our, in our area, unfortunately, yay, New York, uh, they're going to be fairly high. You don't want to get hit with a $5,000 bill next October that you weren't expecting because you're uh, property tax, your school tax bill is due. And then as soon as you get over that shock in January, your town tax is due. There's another $3,000 or $2,500 coming out. So instead of doing that, what we do is we take your taxes and your homeowner's insurance. We just add them together and we divide by 12 and you'll pay that amount every month to us. And then we'll pay the actual taxes and insurance every year for you when they're due. Okay. There are no markups. There's no setup charges. There's no extra fees. If your uh, if your homeowner's insurance is use an easy number twelve hundred dollars a year, we're going to collect a hundred dollars a month with your payment. And you're not cutting separate checks or anything. I know nobody cuts checks anymore. I'm old. Bear with me. Uh, but we're not going to collect that separately. It just goes in lump sum, and then we'll pay it out when it's due. Okay. So all that is part of your house insurance. You see the last tab topic there, your uh, HOA, Homeowners Association, management dues, maintenance fees. This is if you're buying something like a condo, a uh, a townhouse, a PUD, or a uh, co-op, which in all disclosure, we don't do co-ops here. Uh, it's a different animal. You're not really buying land. You're actually buying uh, shares in a business. It's, it's a different animal, so we don't do them here. But if you have some kind of a homeowners association or management dues, that also goes into calculating whether or not this home is affordable to you. We're going to look at that payment. We're just not going to collect it from you. That you would pay on your own, just so you know. Okay. Um, moving on. So what are we looking at? It's what we call your debt ratios, commonly referred to as DTI, debt to income, DTI. Again, you don't have to write that down, but if you hear that term out there, your DTI, this is what we're talking about. We're going to take that housing payment that we just talked about, that whole housing payment, and we're going to divide it by your usable income. And that's going to get us our front ratio or our housing ratio, as you see on the screen. Okay. Um, what we're also going to do is we're going to take your total credit report debt and your housing payments, put those together, divide that by your gross income, and we're going to come up with your back end ratio. Now, what do we want those numbers to be? It depends. Different programs have different limits. We have programs. A lot of programs don't use the front end ratio anymore. Okay. It's something, again, I'm old. When I started in the business, uh, we didn't want that housing payment to be over 28% of your gross income. I'm going to sidetrack a little bit here for you. I want to point out, I keep saying gross income. Okay. That is what we're going to use if you're a regular W-2 employee, if you're on a fixed income, like a retirement pension, um, uh, social security, that type of thing, we're going to use your gross income. If you are self-employed, we're getting rental income, something like that. We are not going to use your gross income. Again, we have a formula that we use to come up with it, but just for ease of conversation going forward, I'm going to keep using gross. The point I want to make with that, if you are W-2 and you have a regular job, you know very well, very painfully aware 
that there is a big difference in a lot of cases between your gross income and your net income. We will use your gross income to qualify. So all your payments that are going towards Social Security, that are going towards Medicare, that are going towards your state and federal taxes, that are going towards your health insurance, that are going towards union dues, all that other stuff that comes out. We're not taking that into account. We are using your gross pay. Okay, so when we qualify you, what we're looking for, we'll use the back end ratio. We're generally looking for you to be around 45%. Okay, so about 40. So again, if you fig, if you figure you make, and everything breaks down monthly. So if you make $5,000 a month, um, I'm going to use an easy number. It's late. Uh, if you make $10,000 a month, we're going to use 45% of that. So $4,500 can go towards your house payment and all of your debts. Actually, I'm sorry, not all your debts, all your credit report debts, because there are other things that we don't take into account. OK, we're not going to take into account your cable bill. We're not going to take into account your Netflix bill. We're not going to take into account uh, your your car insurance. We're not going to take into account your uh, your phone bill. OK, unless you use a credit card to pay for these and then it's part of your credit card debt. But as far as those individual bills, we're not looking at that stuff. So it's what we see on the credit report plus your house payment. OK, that needs to be, generally speaking, under 45 percent of your gross pay. We do have programs that can go higher than that. So it does all depend on the strength of the rest of the file and what type of program that you're looking at. OK, but as a general rule of thumb, a lot of times we'll even start at 43 percent because there are some programs that that's the limit. All right. So just giving you that information. Again, the important thing is when you speak with your mortgage professional, your loan officer, just be honest and open with them in terms of what you you know, what's on your credit report. We're going to look to run credit and see everything anyway. Um, but and and make sure that you're open in terms of what how this works best is you get us the documentation, let us do our job, work up the numbers, and then we report back to you. OK, uh, so anyway, so that's the uh, the second category of capacity. I know we're moving through kind of quick here, but I want to make sure we have time to move this all in. So I'm going to go ahead and ask my partners here to unmute. So Rich, we have, uh, we'll start with you this time. Do we have any questions from the live crowd in regards to capacity and income? Not, not at the present time, Dave. Okay, don't be shy, folks. This works best when you're asking questions. I got to make sure everybody's still awake out there. Mike, what do we got going on in the chat room? We have one that came in actually before you started capacity. Um, it's how often do you get funding for the Home Buyer Dream Grant? And are there 11 spots total for the year? Yeah, so uh, it's once a year. That date changes. This year it opened up much earlier. Years past, it would open up in like March or April. This year it opened up in January. So, um, so that's it. Uh, that runs the allotment of the slots that we have runs through the end of August. And if we've used all of our slots, we may get um, a few extra slots assigned to us every year. We do get a few extra slots assigned to us because we generally use all of ours and some banks don't. So that money gets repooled. But yeah, that's, that's uh, once a year. And then again, at the end of the year, towards the end of the year, we might get some. more. Okay. How about on uh, the capacity? Nothing at this time. Okay, great. Again, guys, I need to make sure you're awake with me here. So don't be shy about any questions that, that you have. All right, please. Uh, plus, it gives me a break where I don't have to uh, talk for a moment. I know you guys don't care. So anyway, third C, we're getting into credit. Okay, this is the scary topic, right? So the things that we're looking at when it comes to credit, uh, most what everybody kind of focuses in on and, uh, is the credit score. And that does have an impact generally on what we can do. Um, but there's a lot of other things that come into play here. So we'll talk about credit score a little bit. Uh, what credit score do I need to get approved? Any guesses? Depends. Okay. So um, we have some programs that you might need to be in the upper 600s. We have some programs that are going to the lower 600s. Uh, if you have no credit score, we may have programs available to you there as well. And if you're under, uh, if you're under, you know, for the most part, our programs require at least a 620 score, but it is possible that we may be able to do something below that. But that box of available programs really starts to shrink down. Okay. Um, you know, in order for any lender to issue you $80,000, $150,000, $400,000 to buy a house, we want to get some 
good feelings, some warm and fuzzies about your ability to repay. How you've repaid things in the past, obviously, is a big indicator on that. So um, the credit scores do come into play. Even if your credit score qualifies you for a program, it can still come into play because certain things will be affected by your credit score. A lower credit score might increase your uh, mortgage insurance. Lower credit score might increase your rate or your fees on the loan. Okay. There's all different factors that come into that stuff. So obviously the higher the credit score, the better. Basically the way that this works, anything 780 and above is considered A plus. Okay. For most programs, again, some programs have different limits, but for most programs, anything 780 and above is considered A plus. Every 20 points below that sort of puts you into a slightly different tier. Okay. So 740, 760, 740, 720. So that's where, as you fall into these different tiers, uh, things can get a little bit different. It might cost you a little bit more in, uh, in expenses. It might cost you a little bit more in your insurance, things like that. Okay. Uh, those are things we don't have really much of any control over. We are subject to the whim of the programs that we use. All right. Um, when we talk about credit score and I, I don't, this is not a credit report focused seminar. Uh, that's something different, but I will tell you a couple of things in regards to that. Uh, obviously, what you want to work on is making sure that you have available credit. So if you have one credit card and it's got a $4,000 limit, don't be over $2,000 on your usage. Okay. You want to be under 50%. If you can get under 30%, that's, that's the top box. If you're under 50%, that's a different level. If you're over 50%, and as you get higher and you're getting to the point, if you owe $4,900 on a card that has a $5,000 limit, that's definitely going to negatively affect your score down, okay? Obviously, making payments on time, having available credit. So one of the examples I give is this. Let's say you owe $5,000, the example I just gave. Let's say you owe $4,900 and you have one card and it's a $5,000 limit and that's all that you have. Somebody else has a bunch of cards, they owe $4,900, but they have $25,000 in credit limits. Their score is gonna be affected much, much less than yours because it doesn't. it's not the individual card so much as it is a total view of what your, your available credit is. If you have cards that are open and you don't use them, as long as they're not costing you an annual fee, don't close them. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they wanna get ready to buy a house or buy any type, you know, make any type of financial maneuver is they will start closing out accounts that they're not using. That is one of the worst things that you can do. Once you have it closed out, you now lose whatever your history is. You've had perfect payments on it for five years. That's gone because it's closed. You no longer have available credit. So again, now your total usage is going to go up. So you're, you're doing a disservice to yourself. One of the things I hate having as one of the conversations up front with anybody is, I just did this because my uncle told me I should. Wasn't that a good move? There's no putting the toothpaste back in the tube there, folks. If you've done it, you've done it. We got to move on. But if you haven't, don't do it, right? Leave those open. Now, that doesn't mean go open up 10 new cards so you have all this limit out there. That also can lower your credit score. So uh, like most things in life, it's all about balance, all right? We want to have balance. We want to have accounts that are, a few accounts that are open and you're showing good usage of them. You're using them, paying them off or not using them at all, but you have a credit limit out there. That's the best indicator that you're going to keep making your payments, Okay. Um, we'll run through the rest of this. So frozen or locked bureaus, obviously, uh, we hear all the time about uh, data breaches and fraud alert, fraud things being out there. I'm going to lump these together. So if you have your credit reports frozen or locked, please, before uh, we speak and you have us on your credit, you're going to have to call up and get them unfrozen or unlocked. That's not something we can do for you. You have to make that call so that when we run the credit, it actually shows up. If you have a fraud alert, if you have had some kind of issue in the past or been subject to one of these data breaches, you might have a fraud alert. You need to make sure that you're in, you don't have to do anything in terms of taking that off, but you have to make sure the information that's out there is correct. I've seen plenty of times where somebody had a fraud alert. What happens is we run your credit and it'll say, hey, fraud alert. It'll be a big, you know, big thing on there. You must call this number to clear the fraud alert. That number is your number that's on there. It's not to call the credit bureaus. It's call you, Joe Smith and make sure that you really applied. Well, if the number that's on the credit bureau is not correct, how are we now going to correct it? How are we going to make good contact with you? Doesn't mean that we can't do anything, but it's just a roadblock. It's a speed bump in us being able to do the, the right job for you, okay? Uh, so make sure your fraud alerts are all up to date. The numbers are correct. 
Um, you know, a lot of people don't have home, house phones anymore. If it has your old house phone number on there, that's not going to help us to get in touch with it. So that's that. And we can't do anything. We can't do a prequal. We can't move forward until we clear that fraud alert. Uh, credit history, we've talked about that a, a little bit already. Number of active accounts, we talked about that a little bit already. Again, it's all about a balance. Um, people closing out accounts thinks, think it's a great thing to do. Generally, that'll hurt your score. Delinquency, obviously any delinquency is bad, but there's different levels of bad, okay? 30 days late on a credit card, not great, not horrible, not going to kill you. Eight months late on a car loan where it went to repossession, obviously, the bigger the event, the more it's going to affect your scores and more it's going to affect maybe a waiting period that we have to have if you've had a bankruptcy. Now we're going to have to wait a few years before your bankruptcy was discharged before we can go ahead and, and do a loan. How long is that going to be? Depends on the program. Okay, we're not going to get into specifics here. Again, that's something you can talk to your mortgage specialist about. Um, so the bigger the delinquency, the more important the account is the more it's going to affect your credit score, your credit history, and whether or not we can do a loan and what kind of loan we can do for you, okay? So last thing you see out there is alternative sources. So I mentioned before that we may be able to even do a loan for you if you uh, don't have a credit score. Okay, now keep in mind, not having any credit is different than having bad credit, all right? Those are two different things. So if you don't have any credit, either you're young and you just haven't done it yet, or you just never wanted to have it, you could, I've had People in their 40s and 50s that really didn't have any credit. They paid everything cash. Well, that doesn't give us a great idea whether or not you're going to be able to handle a mortgage payment. So we may need to look at alternative sources. So what does that mean? That means uh, if you pay rent, that's generally your first alternative source we're going to look at. If you're renting somewhere and you're paying $1,500 a month, that we might be able to use as, a, as an alternative source where we are showing that you can maintain a, a, a heavy payment. Okay. Now, how do you pay that? Are you paying in cash? Are you paying in check or Venmo or PayPal or something like that? That'll have an impact. Anything you're paying cash, cash, you need to stop and start paying it through some kind of traceable means, okay? You don't have to, but if you want to get pre-qualified for your loan and be able to close smoothly on your loan, that's something that you're going to want to do. We have to be able to trace it. If we can't trace it, then it's of no use to us. Um, so I pay my rent in cash every month. But my landlord's willing to write me a letter that says I pay in cash. That's not something we can use because we don't know who your landlord is. What if it's your uncle or your brother or whatever? Of course, even if it's not a relation and you're not paying well, they may want to put on a letter that you're paying well so you, you can get out of there and get into a different house. So um, so we it needs to be traceable. OK, so again, uh, direct withdrawals from your bank account, transfers from your bank account to their bank account, great. We get the 12 months history, no problem. Uh, some programs might even require 18 months, be aware of that. But so yeah, we want to be able to, it has to be traceable. We have to be able to document it in order for it to help us to help you. I'm not saying everybody is going to need those things, but you might need it if your credit report does not show enough trade lines for us to qualify. How many do you need to show? Again, it depends, but generally we're looking at three trade lines for at least a year that you have at least a year's worth of payments on. That's generally what we look at, okay? You see across the bottom there, annualcreditreport.com. This I do want you to write down, okay? Annualcreditreport.com. No, I don't get a commission for sending you there. This is the government-sponsored agency that allows you to pull a free credit report from each of the three bureaus. There's three main bureaus out there. We use all three. On, we get all three on one report. You can pull them separately. Go to annualcreditreport.com. Again, it's a government-sponsored site that allows you to pull copies of your credit report. So the old uh, limitation was you could get one free credit report per company, excuse me, per year. So Equifax, TransUnion, um, each of the credit, each of those companies, you could get one per year. When COVID started, they changed that where you could get it, I think, once a week. Now, that might be a little obsessive uh, to do something like that. But if you haven't had your credit pulled recently, you're not sure what's out there. Again, we hear all kinds of horror stories. I've seen all kinds of things where things showed up on somebody's credit and they weren't aware of it, whatnot. You don't want to wait until you find your dream house to start discovering this stuff because it can take quite a while to get fixed. Think about it. If there's an error on your credit report, it is not XYZ Bank's main priority to make sure your credit is fixed. It's your priority, but it's not theirs. So that could take months sometimes. So this is something that you want to do. Um, this is not, in theory, is not going to affect your credit score. 
The, the poll that you do through annualcreditreport.com is not supposed to affect your score in any way, shape, or form. So you can pull that today. We can pull it tomorrow through our regular means and uh, shouldn't have any impact on your credit scores because you had that extra pull in there. Okay, so that's just something I recommend very highly. You want to know where you're starting. That will not give you a score for free, but it will give you an idea what's out there. At least you can check and make sure that everything is being reported. You have a loan that you paid off years ago and you haven't thought about it. All of a sudden you pull up, oh, it's still showing I owe one payment. You can get in touch with the company and get that cleared up before we really start with our process. That's the way that you want to do that. Okay. I know I just ran through an awful lot of stuff there, but we are winding, uh, you know, winding down on time a little bit here. So I want to make sure we get everything in. Again, I'm going to go ahead and ask my partners if I can manipulate my mouse here. Go ahead and let me know if we have any questions out there in regards to credit or anything that we have gone over to this point. Mike, why don't you go first? We have two. Uh, the first one, that Home Buyer Dream Program, is it a $20,000 cash down payment grant? Uh, well, it can be used for down payment and closing costs. Okay, it is up to $20,000. $500 of that goes towards the, there's a housing, um, there's an education program that you have to take. It, it's not that involved. It, it makes it sound like it's more, but um, we have to take a, a home buyer education course. The $500 can go towards paying for that. And you have 19.5 to use towards down payment and or closing costs. Okay. And the next, which credit score company should we go off due to the different reports such as FICO or Chase? Okay. So good question. Um, so Chase is not a credit reporting company. That is just a bank, uh, much like us, only not as good. Uh, so you don't want to go to Chase. But uh, no, so there's uh, three main bureaus out there. Um, generally, and this is not an Ulster savings thing. Any mortgage lender that you go to, I'm going to say in the free world, is going to go through, all. they're going to pull all three bureaus. We get one report with all three bureaus. It's called a tri-merge, tri for three, three bureaus. It'll be tri merged on one report and we should be able to see everything that's out there. So my recommendation is that you can pull each of those bureaus for free. Again, it used to be uh, uh, back in the day, it was once a year and it was changed where you could pull it more often for free. Um, I, I don't, I apologize. I, I don't know what the latest is on that. I think it's still unlimited or you know, once a week or something like that. So my recommendation is if it is unlimited, go ahead and pull all three, make sure you're seeing everything that's out there. And then, um, and then you know what you have to work with. If they have changed back where you can only pull each bureau once a year, um, now it depends. And this is something I think you could do all the time, not just when you're trying to buy a house. I think, you know, for, for years, you always want to make sure that your credit report is up to speed. It affects your car insurance. It affects if you go for a car loan, if you go for credit cards, whatever. So, so this is something that you could always do. If they go back to where you can only get one per year per bureau, uh, you may want to just pull one every every th uh, three months, or I'm sorry, every four months, pull one, pull one, wait four months, pull another, wait four months, pull another. And this way throughout the year, you're you're getting to see a good idea of what's out there. I have one more that just came in, but it, it's in regards to grants. So do you want me to wait and kind of uh, yeah, back to grants at the end? Yeah, let's wait till the end to go back to that one. Okay. Uh, Rich, we have anything from the live crowd there? You're on mute. I think Rich stepped away to help somebody for a minute. Uh, okay. Well then, uh, my apologies to my apologies to the group that's there. Uh, if you do have anything, we'll get to it on the next section or at the end. Okay. Just check my time here. All right, we're doing good. I think we're back on track. So my fourth C, collateral. Collateral is the property you're buying. So there's a few different things that we're looking at. What type of home it is what condition the home is in, and then what we call the fair market value. So what type of home are you buying? In some respects, we don't really, I hate to say it this way, but we, we're not really concerned with whether it's a ranch house or it's a colonial or it's a, a you know raised ranch or anything like that. When we talk about what type of home we are talking about, is it a single family home? So just one unit, you're going to live there. Is it a two unit, three unit, four unit? Okay. On our end here uh, in the residential mortgage side, we can do anything up to a four unit property, okay? Anything up to a four unit property is residential. Anything over that becomes a commercial property. 
a lot of stuff we talked about does not apply, just so that you know, okay? We do have a commercial lending division here, and we're happy to move you over there. If you're finding a building that has six units in it, uh, we're happy to match you up with one of our reps there, and they can, they can work on that. But anything one to four units that's residential, we can do that. Um, we also do condominiums. We do uh, what's called a pod or a townhome, uh, something that's attached uh, like that. We also can do manufactured homes. We can do single wide or double wide manufactured homes. If you're looking at a house that is a, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're looking at a house that is a modular home, that's just treated like any other single family. Okay. Now, some of these other types of homes like a condo or manufactured home, mobile home, those do have different conditions on them. There's asterisks on those that we got to look at and there's different things that not every program allows everything, or we may need to um, do a little bit extra digging on certain things with that. There's limitations uh, with ma manufactured homes, and for instance, in terms of how old it can be. So there's different limitations there, but we do them and we can do them all the time. Okay. Uh, condition of the home and fair market value. We're going to get into that a little bit here. So the fair market value, what's going to happen is during your process, you're going to pay for an appraisal. It's the only thing we make you pay for up front here at Ulster Savings Bank is we, you will pay for your appraisal. How much is that going to be? It depends on what we're doing, but generally think of somewhere around four seventy five dollars and up. Okay, if it's a regular single family home under, forgive me, but I'm thinking $850,000, it's going to cost you four seventy five dollars for an appraisal. Okay, just be aware of that. We don't do an application fee or anything like that. Other banks might, we only do, we have you pay for the appraisal. There's no markup on that. That's just what it costs us to order. So appraisal is done through a third party, independent third party. We do have to, um, it has to go through us. You can't pick your appraiser and have them set, submit the uh, document into us. You're going to go uh, when you apply and we're ready to move forward. You find your house, you're going to sign your contract. Then we're going to order the appraisal. It goes through our appraisal department. It's done on a round robin basis. We can't pick, hey, make sure you get Joe for this property because we need somebody that's real you know, lenient. Uh, but no, it goes round robin with a, a licensed appraiser. They go out to the house, they do their thing, and we get a report back uh, a few days later. So that's what happens. Again, it's an independent third party. One of the complaints that we hear out in the world is, oh, the bank appraised my house for way too low. Banks do not generally do not appraise houses. OK, maybe some banks do. Generally, banks don't appraise houses. It's done through a licensed independent third party um, contractor that is a uh, an appraiser. And they're going to compare the house that you're buying to at least three, if not somewhere between three to six other houses in the area that have sold recently and or are for sale currently. OK, and they're going to compare things. How old is your house compared to their house? If your house is that you're looking to buy is 12 years old and there's a house that's 60 years old, those aren't really comparable houses. Right. Um, if your house is a single level ranch, they're not going to compare it to a uh, condo or they're not going to compare it to a center hall colonial. Right. They're going to look to compare it to houses of similar size, similar design, similar areas. If you're uh, they're not going to compare your house on a cul-de-sac that's right on a main road. OK, generally, we're going to try not to. If there's just not enough inventory out there for uh, for the houses, then they may need to <clears throat> excuse me. They may need to stretch and do that. And then they'll make an adjustment for it. Well, this house is on a busy road. This house is on a cul-de-sac. Everything else is equal. This house is worth twenty thousand dollars more because it's in a quiet area. There's things like that that are done. So that's what the appraisal is. It's a series of pluses and minuses comparing your house to the other houses, okay? So condition, what kind of condition are we looking for? Well, it doesn't have to be immaculate new construction. It needs to be in reasonable move-in condition without any health or safety issues, okay? Health or safety issues, now that can be subjective, but generally things like mold, broken glass, missing handrails off of a staircase, things like that, that's going to be a speed bump for us. Doesn't mean that it kills the deal, but something generally has to be done before we can close. So we would go back to the seller. You would go back to the seller and say, hey, you're missing a stairway, a stair uh, railing on this staircase. That needs to be done before we can close. The seller can say, okay, I'll put it in. And we have to send the appraiser out to make sure it's done. Or the seller can say, too bad. I'm selling this as is. Now it's up, up to you. Do you want to pay to get work done on a house that you don't own? OK, that's something that that's that's a personal decision and it's up to you. Uh, if there's mold, we need to look at that and how much is it going to cost to fix the mold, things like that. OK, so these are things the appraiser is going to go out. What I will say, in addition to the appraisal, 
It's not a requirement for most programs, but you're going to want to get an inspection done. These are two different terms, inspection and appraisal. Generally speaking, there are some programs that inspections required, but generally speaking, inspection is not required. But to me, you absolutely should be getting it done. It's going to cost you a few hundred dollars, but you're going to find, if you get a good inspector, you're going to find what's wrong with the house now and what might go wrong in the next, you know, X number of months. You know, hey, the boiler works, but it's all crusted over and it's clearly was leaking at some point and it's on its last legs, but it works now. Well, guess what? That's a $5,000, $8,000 repair that you might get the first month you move into the house. You want to know about things like that, okay? The appraiser is not doing that much digging. Okay. You're paying the inspector to find out everything that's wrong with the house. The appraiser's going out, they're going to be there 10, 15 minutes, snapping a couple pictures, and they're out of there. Most of their work is done in the office doing that comparison that we talked about. Okay. Uh, something has to kind of smack them in the face in order for them to make notice. So there's a brown stain on the ceiling because there was a water leak or there is a water leak. They're going to note that there's broken glass. There's a missing handrail. They're going to note that. But they're not crawling around in the attic generally. They're not going to get up on the roof and check and make sure your tiles are okay. That's not what they do. They're going to snap a couple pictures and they're out of there. So um, that's why it's important. I did a little sidetrack on you there for the inspection. It's important you do that for your own uh, sake. Like I said, we do have some programs that do require, but generally that's just an FYI for yourself. Um, so if we see any uh, health or safety conditions, those might need to be fixed before we're able to close. And again, that all boils into the fair market value. Obviously, a house that needs a new roof is the same exact house is going to be worth a little bit less than a house that just had the roof, roof replaced last year and should be good for 20 years. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So uh, those are generally the things I want to talk to you about um, in terms of fair market value. One of the questions we usually get on these is what happens if the house doesn't appraise for what I want to pay for? It? Okay. So keep in mind, your fair market value is not what you will pay for it it's what the an average person would pay for it so you go out and see this house and you fall in love with this house and it's the greatest house you've ever seen and you're willing to pay three hundred thousand for it the appraiser goes out and does their thing and they come up with a value of two hundred and fifty thousand. well now what happens here that's up to you if you love this house and you're willing to pay an extra fifty thousand for it and you have the money available have at it. Or you can try to negotiate with the seller and say, hey, you're asking 300, it appraised for 250. I only want to pay 250. Maybe the seller will come down. Maybe they won't. That's up to them. They might be willing to stick to their guns. We don't know. So you'll look at, you'll sign a contract with the seller. The contract will have some terms in it. You have to get an appraisal done by X date. And once your appraisal is done, you have X number of days to dispute the value. And then it's up to you and the seller and your attorneys and your realtors to work all that out where it goes. The bank really has no say in any of that, okay? Uh, but I will tell you, we are going to land off the lower of the purchase price or the appraised value. This is very important. I'm going to repeat it. We're going to lend off the lower of the appraised value or the purchase price. So the example I just gave, let's say we're doing 10% down and it's a three, $300,000 sales price. So we're going to do a $290,000 loan. Well, we're not going to loan you $290,000 on a house that the appraiser says is worth two fifty. dollars There's no sense in that for us to do. Okay. So we're going to do our 10% down based off that two fifty. dollars Okay. And we're, so that's where that's going to be. Um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I was using 10%. It was $10,000. Um, but I think you, you get the point. So if it's 300,000, 10% down, obviously $30,000. I'm sorry, it's late and we're getting a little tired here. I'm getting a little punchy, folks. Stay with me. Uh, so if it's 300,000, 10% down, that would be a 270 loan amount. We're not going to lend 270 if the house is worth 250. We're going to use 250 if that's what the appraiser says. So the lower of those two numbers is what we're going to base our loan amount off of. How do you make up the difference? Again, that's between you and the seller to try to work out. We've seen instances where the seller comes down right away. We've seen instances where they won't budge. And we've seen instances where they come up somewhere in between. Now that's subject to you being able to afford the rest of that house. Okay, if you can come up with the money yourself and you still want to pay 300,000 for it, that's up to you, not an issue, okay? So 
again, a lot of information there. I'm going to turn over to my partners. We'll see. Hopefully, Rich is back in action here. Um, so, Rich, do we have any questions from the live crowd? Hold on. Is that hold true if the purchase price is less than the fair market value? Uh, so he wants to know if, uh, yeah, if it holds true if the purchase price is less than the fair market value. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, if your appraisal comes in high, that's great. Okay, that means you have some built-in equity up front. So when the appraisal is done, I want to make sure you guys understand this. When the appraisal is done, the only ones that know about that are us and you. Okay, and I tell every, I've always told my clients for 30 years, I told them the same thing. You do not mention that to anybody, not to your attorney, not to your realtor, not to anybody. The last thing that you want is the seller to find out somehow that the house over appraised. So you're buying it for 300,000 and the appraisal comes in at 330. That's just between you and us. Nobody else gets that number. It is not public record. Uh, the seller finds out that appraised for 330. Guess what? That house might go back on the market all of a sudden. So we don't want to run into any, any type of issues with that. Uh, yes, you have a signed contract, but we've seen them broken uh, in the past. So no, that's just between you and us. Great question. Go ahead. Anything uh, else, Rich? Yep. Hold on. This, yep. So this appraisal person, how do you contact them? How do you business says? Do you have to be there in person with them? Do they are they pretty much self-contained? So so he wanted to know on the appraisal person, do they have does the borrower have to contact them? Was number one. And number two, does the does the borrower have to be at the property when they show up to do the appraisal? Okay, good question. So generally, um, so both of them, I think, will be a no. So no, you can't order your own appraisal. We have to order it as a company. It's just me as a loan officer, I can't order it. We have a separate department that is kind of on an island here. Uh, they're Ulster Savings employees, but they will order the appraisal. And like I said, it's kind of round robin, and it'll go to somebody that's licensed, that's familiar with the area. Um, and that's another important thing against some of the national lenders. They might just use a service for that. Uh, and, and that's federal regulations. Nobody can, no loan officer can order their own appraisal. Uh, so some of the national lenders might use some kind of a national service. So you don't necessarily get somebody who's familiar with the area and that can hurt your values. But yeah, we have to order it. You pay for it. We order it. Uh, generally, you would not be at the house when the appraiser gets out there. Uh, that is something that the report is done. Somebody from the seller side has to let the appraiser in. Your real, It might be your realtor, but it wouldn't necessarily and wouldn't generally be you. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but it's also not going to be very exciting. Like I said, the appraiser is going to be in and out and they're not going to answer any questions that you ask them at that point. They're not an inspector. Your inspector, you're paying to find problems with the house. Your appraiser, you just want them to be in and out and you don't want to get on their bad side because some of the things are hard nosed numbers in terms of, all right, it's three bedrooms, it's two baths, it's 1500 square feet. There's other things that are their opinion. Okay. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that they stay happy and, and on our side. So you don't want to be in their way. All right. Uh, Mike, we got anything in? I have, the... I have one more. Okay. Go ahead. go ahead. If the appraiser finds something, it has to go back out to show that it was done. Is that a second fee or is that all built into the original $500 fee? Could you hear that? Yep. I heard that one. That was good and clear. So, uh, yeah, that'll be a, it'll be a, an additional fee. It wouldn't be another five hundred dollars. Uh, there's what we call a trip fee. The appraiser has to get paid to go back out. Um, so uh, that will depend on the situation. But I'm thinking the latest and Richie might be able to help me with this. I think it's up one seventy five right now. Uh, I was going to say one fifty, but it could have been could yeah. have gone to one seventy five. It's around one fifty. Yeah, the somewhere around there as as a trip fee. So if there's something up front. Uh, that, you know, and keep in mind, we're not going out to the house generally. Uh, the loan officer almost never is going to go out to the house. That's between you and the realtor to kind of pick up on and maybe your inspector. So if there's something that you know is going to need to be or more than likely is going to need to be addressed, you might as well try to get it addressed up front. Again, sometimes the seller won't do it until they find out that they have to, in which case that's just kind of the cost of doing business. And I have one more question. If we guess the same exact number that the appraiser comes up with, do you get paid? Will you waive the fee? <laughs> no, <laughs> I can answer that one. 
No, so I could hear the question. I don't know if everybody at home could. So if they come up with the same number, do you get your feedback? No, there's no, it's not a contest. It's, it's not, uh, it's not somebody guessing your weight at the, uh, at the county fair. No, that basically, and, and just to clarify, that fee gets charged when the appraiser shows up at the house. So the second the appraiser shows up at the door, that fee is getting charged. If that house is not ready to be appraised, if there's some kind of an issue there, that fee is getting charged, uh, whether the house appraises out or not. That is not part of it. Okay. So, all right, Mike, what do we got? Anything good in the chat room? You answered one of them, but we have, what if the purchase price is higher than appraised? The bank won't cover the difference. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what we just talked about. So, yes, if if the appraisal comes in below the purchase price, we're going to use the appraisal as our value to base everything off of. So again, if you're putting 10% down and the house appraises at 250, you're, you're buying it for 300 and it's 10% down, but the house appraises for 250, we're going to do the 10% down off of the 250. So we're going to, um, we're going to lend 225 and you're either going to make up the difference between the two or you and the seller are going to have to work something out. Okay. We're not, the, the value is not what one person would pay for it. It's what basically an average cost would be. Okay. We good. Otherwise guys. That's the only one I have as far as collateral. Okay. All right. Good. We are moving on. <clears throat> so some additional information. So we talk a bunch of times about talking to your loan officer, your loan originator, your mortgage specialist. What are you doing? You're getting pre-qualified. Okay. Getting pre-qualified for Ulster savings, we say absolutely should be your first step to home ownership. If you go out looking for houses, now most of your realtors aren't going to show you houses with a without a pre-qualification letter. Uh, but you obviously in this day and age, you can find basically almost everything online. So you don't fall in love with your house, then go and get pre qualified to find out that you can't afford that house. Or for some reason we can't lend on it. Okay. Let's get those numbers done up front. It's that is absolutely the order of operations that it should go. We're going to find out what your buying power is. Uh, what are your down payment requirements? Again, do you qualify for any of these low down payment loans or do you have to put a little bit more down? Uh, what is your new monthly payment? One of the conversations I have had so many times in my career, it's not even funny, is somebody say, yeah, I want to buy a house for $250,000. Okay, but you don't understand what that entails. So now I go through and I do the numbers. Okay, we've got your principal and interest. We've got your property taxes. We've got your homeowner's insurance. We ha might have mortgage insurance, might have flood insurance. Now we put that all together in a payment. And all of a sudden that payment is way higher than you were thinking it was going to be. OK, so we it, finding out what your new monthly payment is in a lot of ways is more important than the the what the total number is. OK, it's not the three hundred thousand that you can afford. It's the twenty eight hundred dollars a month that you can afford. All right. That's what we had to do. We do have 100 percent online prequalification process. OK, you can go out to ulstersavings.com. You go under uh, personal and loans there. And you can actually do an application right online, get it started. And then we're going to hook you up with one of our mortgage specialists like Mike or Rich that are on the line with us tonight. And they'll take over from there. They'll have a bunch of other questions to go through with you. Look at some documentation that you give in, and then we'll be able to do it. But you don't have to come in and meet face to face. If it's something that you want to do, we're certainly open to doing that. That's not a problem. But we have many, many clients these days that we don't meet until the closing and sometimes not even then. So um that's something that you have. We do have the disclaimer at the bottom. Prequalification is not a commitment to lend. This is important. I'm not trying to rain on anybody's parade, but we do our prequalification that is based off of certain assumptions, okay? Generally, we're running the credit. We're looking at your income. We're looking at your assets. We're looking at the whole package, putting it together, say, okay, based off of everything, Mrs. Jones, you can qualify for a $300,000 purchase with 10% down, so a $270,000 loan. Go find your house of your dreams. It takes Mrs. Jones six months to find her house. She comes back. We have to repo credit. We have to get updated income. We have to get updated assets. In the meantime, she has switched jobs. She now makes less money. She has gone out and bought furniture, had to, her engine and her car blew up, and she had to buy a new car. She now has a new car loan on her credit. Uh, she has spent money that she had saved up before. We're in a different boat, okay? 
So pre-qualification is never a guarantee of being able to lend. What we can do is get it as close as possible by you working with us to give us the information we're looking for, okay? And we're going to ask for a decent amount. I'm going to put something up on the screen uh, in, in a couple mo minutes here uh, detailing that, but we're going to ask for a lot of information. It's not because we're curious. It's not because we're trying to be difficult or anything like that. It's so that we can do our job properly for you. We are working for you. You're hiring us to do this job for us. If you are trusting us to do that, then you need to work with us and understand that anything we're asking for is something that we are going to need, okay? So we ask you for 10 things and you give us eight, we'll do 80% of the job. That's not really what you're looking for. Generally, you're looking for 100% of the job. So just work with us on that. Um, understand, again, we're only gonna ask for things that we truly feel that we need or the program definitely asks for. OK, so we're going to ask for that. We're going to do the pre-qualification. You're going to go out and find your house and we may need to update things. Uh, credit report, credit reports. Some programs are good for 90 days. Some programs it's good for 120 days. OK, so again, depending on how long it takes you to find your house, we may need to update your credit. Um, most of the other documentation is good for 120 days, your pay stubs, your W-2s, things like that, but not always. So just understand we're going to collect the stuff. We're going to want to recollect it. If you're self-employed, we're going to use the most recent tax return, okay? Obviously, that's not something you need to update during the year, but this time of year gets really interesting because a lot of people haven't done their 2023 taxes yet, so we're going to use 2022s. We can, but is that really an accurate reflection of what you've done? Because at this point, it's well over a year old. A lot of the information could be close to two years old, so, um, so that's something to take into account. It might be a thing where, hey, Based off your 2022, I can only qualify you here. But if you get your 2023 done and you said you're telling us your 2023s are going to look way better, maybe now we can qualify you up for a higher loan amount. OK, so that's something this time of year always gets a little interesting. Once we hit April 15th, then obviously we're looking for the most recent year's tax returns anyway. Uh, but right now we'll work with 2022s, but it might be in your best interest to do 2023s. Don't know until we take a look at it. All right. So documentation, again, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and read this to you. That'll be very boring. Uh, you can find this type of stuff online as well. We have an online guide. We have a physical guide that we can give out to people and it'll have this type of list. Understand it's basically income and asset information. It might be credit information if we got to use an alternative source like we talked about before. Okay. Um, so if we got to get uh, bank statement showing that you paid your rent or you paid your phone bill or whatever. That's something that we might need to do. But otherwise, we're looking at income, asset information. Uh, when you see at the bottom, other items needed might be uh, if you tell us that you're collecting child support, we're going to need a copy of the divorce decree and proof that you've actually receiving the child support, uh, things like that. So there are other other items that may come up. So don't hold uh, any specific list that you see online as the gospel because it certainly may vary from time to time okay so what types of loans are there out there okay well your conventional fixed rate mortgage that's your average everyday loan that we talk about the most we certainly do the most of those here so that's just a fixed rate your your rate and your payment are going to be the same from your first payment until your loan is done whether you're doing a 10-year 20-year 30-year fixed 30-year fixed rate is just your average vanilla loan that overwhelming majority of people take out. Your payment will be the same from your first payment to your last payment in terms of your mortgage payment. Obviously, if we're doing an escrow for tax and insurance, those change as your tax and insurance change, but your payment uh, your payment on the loan itself won't. Your adjustable rate mortgages, these are very popular as well. So ARM might be called an ARM, you can hear that. So these generally are fixed for a short period, short, well, somewhat short period of time, and then it changes to an adjustable afterwards. So we can do three five, seven, and 10 years where the loan is fixed for say a five-year period and then it changes to an adjustable after that. Why would anybody do that? Uh, it depends on what your situation is. If you're, you're, you're kind of playing the market and taking a gamble on something like that. So the rate might be lower for the first five years than a 30-year fixed, but then after that fifth year, it, it can adjust from the sixth year on to the end. That loan becomes adjustable every year based off where the current rates are. So and if you're willing to play the market, that type of loan might make more sense for you. Uh, you see on here, we do construction loans and renovation mortgages. So uh, you want to buy a piece of land and build on it, or you already own a piece of land and you want to build on it, where you can do a construction loan. 
Renovation loan means there's an existing house and maybe it's an existing house, but it was built in the 50s and you want to upgrade the kitchen and the bathrooms and the electric and all that stuff. We can do that all one shot, buy the house and fix it up all one shot. Again, uh, there's a types of loans that not everybody does anymore. They're they're more complicated. Listen, not here to sugarcoat anything. It's not all candy. <clears throat> it's not all candy and roses in the mortgage world, right? They're more complicated, but if it gets you the house and it gets you into your dream home, it's worth the extra work up front, right? Uh, you do have to get estimates up front. So there's extra work. You have to work with the seller, make sure they're willing to you know, work because those will generally take a little bit longer to process, but we do them. You've got conforming and jumbo mortgages up there. So, um, so the conforming loan limit, this changes uh, from county to county, but it's really high right now. A conforming loan, which is where your average, you know, most of your loans go, um, it's up in uh, upwards of over $700,000 for a conforming loan size. Anything over that might be considered a jumbo mortgage. A jumbo mortgage has different guidelines and different requirements. We can't do 100% financing on a jumbo loan. We can't do uh, 100%, um, sorry, we can't do 3% down on a jumbo loan. So there are some restrictions there in terms of what we do, what uh, what we can do on those. So if that's something, if you're in that type of market, that's great. We do them all day long, every day, but it will, uh, again, limit that box a little bit. All, pretty much all those grants that we talked about and things like that, that's not going to happen on a, on a jumbo mortgage generally. Uh, government insured loans. We do plenty of these as well. This is where we're talking about terms that you may have heard before, like an FHA loan, uh, a VA loan. If we have any veterans on board, we thank you for your service. We have a couple different options to do VA loans. Um, we have New York State government insured loans. It's called a Sony May loan, State of New York, Sony. Uh, Sony May loan, we do those quite a bit here as well. So there's a, a bunch of different types of government insured loans that we do. And then the last one, I know somebody asked about land mortgage. Um, that is something that we do. Again, most of what we talked about doesn't really apply. Uh, I don't know that there's any grant programs available to do a land mortgage. We're not doing 100% financing on a land loan. Uh, you have to have a bigger down payment. It's a bigger risk because there's no house there, right? So, um, but it is something that we do all the time. If that's something you're interested in, just let your loan officer know up front. Okay. So just want to touch base real quick, some key personnel that you'll deal with. So you see the first one, loan officer, loan consultant, mortgage specialist. There's different terms that different companies use. And even here at Ulster, some people call themselves different things based on what they call themselves at the last company they worked at or whatnot. It's all the same thing. The upfront person that you talk to, they are your main contact upfront. Um, they can take the application, collect a whole bunch of documents. They're going to have you sign some disclosures to move forward all that stuff. They're the ones that are going to pre-qualify and really be there. They're your go-to source uh, for information as we go along. Then the file gets handed off to a loan processor. She's going to take a look at everything that we collected up front, uh, put it together to get it ready to go to underwriting. There, that's also where like the appraisal is getting ordered. Uh, title work might be getting done. There's other things that they're doing. They're doing verifications, making sure that you really uh, work at the place that you say that you work at, things like that. Uh, we trust, but we verify so um, they're working on that. Then the file goes to the underwriter. They're the ones with the power of the pen, okay? You really won't have any contact, direct contact with the underwriter. All the contact um, in terms of going through underwriting will be through the loan processor or the loan officer up front. But the underwriter is the one that takes a look at everything we've collected and your credit report and your income and all that fun stuff. And they're the ones that come up with and say, okay, we're gonna approve the loan. Uh, we're gonna approve the loan and we're ready to go to closing or we're gonna approve the loan but I still want to get a little more information on this or that. Okay. There might be something that's still outstanding. So that's also called the appro loan approval is also called your loan commitment. That's a term you're going to hear out there is loan commitment. That means that you are approved for your loan. And unless something wild happens from that point on, we should be able to get you to closing the underwriter. Once all that stuff is done and you're truly cleared, then it goes to the closing coordinator. They're the ones that are going to reach out to you, reach out to your attorney, and the seller's attorney and the seller, and we're going to coordinate all those people together to set up a closing date where you can go and sign a whole bunch of paperwork. It's a stack like this. As much as we've become a digital world, that's something that is still a uh, live, what we call a wet signature process. So you're going to warm your hands up and you're going to get ready to sign your name a ton of times. And uh, that's what the closing coordinator does. Okay. So you see on here, we've talked about all this stuff, but what are the proper steps 
the, uh, the, the order of operations for buying the home. You'll see this up here again. I don't think anybody needs me to read this to them, but basically gather your docs, get pre-qualified, find your house, submit more docs, sign some papers, get approved, go to closing, get those keys, uh, sign a whole bunch of more paperwork. The keys get slid across the desk to you and you start on the next important chapter of your life, right? That's what we're all here for. And that, folks, brings us to the end of the basic uh, presentation that we're doing tonight. I thank you for staying with us and, and uh, you know, for your questions. We'll stay on for a few minutes more for additional questions. If you happen to be interested in getting your $750 off of closing costs, and I know you all are, see what you're going to do here on the screen. You are going to email the code spring training. I'm a big baseball nerd, so it's baseball season. Pitchers and catchers have now reported, despite the snow on the ground up here. So we're going to email the code spring training to dreams happen at ulstersavings.com. Okay, dreams happen, no spaces, dreams happen at ulstersavings.com. Just email the code spring training. You can put it in the subject line, you can put it in the body, doesn't matter. A couple of things on this. One, we will send you out, we will email you back the certificate. That is a manual process. So if you send that to me tonight or to us tonight, you're not going to get it back tonight. Just be aware of that. Give us about a week. Okay. It's Wednesday night. Or I'm sorry. It's Thursday night. Give us till next Friday or so to get that out to you. It's a manual process. We're going to get a bunch of them together and we're going to send them out to you. We don't send them as a batch. It'll be sent out to you individually. Um, so I would say next Thursday, Friday, start looking in your email for it. It'll come from Ulster Savings Bank. Check your spam folder, okay? Oftentimes it will come into your spam folder. So we just ask you to check for Ulster Savings Bank in your spam folder before you reach out to us to tell us that you didn't get it. <clears throat> but please give us uh, give us about a week or so to get that together. Uh, the other thing I'm gonna ask you to do, if you would, uh, we put a lot of time and effort into putting these programs together. Let us know what you thought. OK, um, honestly, you go ahead and let us know what you thought. If you thought it was helpful, if you thought there was parts that didn't need to be in there, go ahead and put it in there. Be gentle. I'm a little fragile with my ego. OK, I want to make sure. But I do want to make sure I'm doing uh, something that you need and something that provides value to you. Uh, I know this stuff like the back of my hand, obviously, see, I'm not reading a script, so I don't need to go through it. But I want to have something that is important for you guys to hear. So just let us know what you thought in terms of the uh, of the content and the pacing. OK, uh, I hope that you found it helpful. And um, yeah, well, I also want to give out again, if you're interested in getting in touch with uh, Ulster Habitat, that was Carolyn Hurley. Her phone number is 845-340-0907. And her extension is 105. 105 is her extension. That was from Ulster Habitat. If you're looking to get hooked up with any Habitat for Humanity in the other counties, Again, something obviously you can Google or you can reach out to us at the Dreams Happen email address uh, and we can we can help uh, kind of facilitate that as well. And with that, again, I thank you. I'm going to go ahead and turn over to my partners here, uh, Mike and Rich. Mike, do we have any uh, new questions in the chat room? We do. It probably depends. Rubbing off on you. <laughs> but how long is the process from the time you work with the loan officer to get to closing? Absolutely depends. Here's the deal. If uh, if you're working with me, and I'm, you won't be, but if you're working with Mike or Rich or whatnot, they give you a list of 10 things to get together in order for us to get into processing, and it takes you two weeks, then obviously it's going to take you a little longer than the person that it took two days. Okay, so can't really give you that. If everything goes well, OK, there's the moon and stars and sun all aligned and all that. There's no reason on a lot of uh, on a lot of deals that we can't be done in less than a month. OK, if you have your contract signed, if your attorney orders the title, if the uh, realtor sets up the appointment with the appraiser quickly. OK, what I can tell you, the whole point of what we do here at Ulster Savings and what makes us different, we are not going to eliminate stress. Uh, whether it be stress of the process itself or a time source, we are not going to eliminate stress from you. You should be somewhat stressed out. You're spending a ton of money. You're looking to buy a place that you're going to live in for some period of time. Obviously, it's very, very important. There should be some level of stress. What we're going to do is minimize that for you, okay? By prepping you, by doing a course like this up front, we are going to prep you to make sure that you understand what the process is and, uh, and, and the different steps along the way. 
if you work with us, again, we ask you for something, you get it to us the next day. Uh, that's going to go miles and miles towards you being able to close in a reasonable time. If there's something where we've had situations where somebody has done an application and then gone on vacation for two weeks and been MIA from, from us. Obviously, we can't be held responsible if we don't meet your time frame if you're not responding to us and you're not in a situation to do that. Okay, so all the parties, us, you, your attorney, your realtor, we have to work together to get this to come through. So like I said, if everything goes well, we're generally being able to get people, I'll say we should be able to get you cleared to close easily and under a month in this environment and this and the way things are going right now. From there, now it's up to everybody to set their schedule and you don't necessarily know, maybe this seller went away for two weeks and they can't close or your attorney's going away and isn't gonna be around, okay? There's all kinds of things that can happen with that. All right, great question. Anything else there, Mike? Yeah, one more in regards to grants. Uh, for grants, does the person with the higher credit score have the best chance of getting it? Most of the grants are not credit score uh, derived. Okay, I can tell you like the uh, the one that we do that we're part of with the uh, the Home Buyer Dream Grant, credit score is not a factor. Uh, it's almost entirely based off of uh, whether you qualify with their income limits. Okay. Most grants work that way. That I can absolutely tell you. Typically, how much is the attorney and is it always necessary? So we'll go to the second part of that question first. Is it necessary? If you got arrested for murder, you don't have to get an attorney. You can represent yourself. Most people don't recommend it, okay? Now, I know that's an extreme case, but I'm saying that because it's it really is the same thing. No, you don't have to have an attorney, but to have a good real estate attorney can absolutely help you out. At uh, some point, Mike can give you a story of, of somebody that he just closed today that had a real estate attorney that we wouldn't put in the good category, and it caused some issues along the way. Uh, so listen, I've seen it and I've seen it before as well. So no, you want to get a good recommend recommendation for an attorney, either from your loan officer, or maybe from your realtor or ask somebody that you know that bought a house recently and how that went. Um, how much is it going to cost? That That's up to the individual thing. There's no one set fee. Um, I don't know, probably somewhere around $800 to $1,000 these days is probably average. I don't know, Mike, you, you see this stuff more often than I uh, right now. Really between 800 and 1200. Okay. So yeah. Depends and, on the attorney. Yeah. It depends on the attorney and ge geographic. I've had people use an attorney from the city that cost them $2,000. Okay. If you're in New York city, obviously everything's more expensive. So um, generally my suggestion is you use a real estate attorney that's local and, and make sure they're a real real estate attorney. One of the things I'm just going to touch on real quick on this if you look at anybody, if you go out online, just Google, I usually use yellow pages. I know nobody uses the yellow pages anymore. What's a yellow page? Um, so uh, you go online and Google attorneys. Most attorneys will have what they do right on their webpage. Uh, they do estate sales. They do this. They do that. They do the other thing. And at the bottom, it might say real estate. Almost every attorney will say they do real estate. I want that to be in the top part of that list, okay? If they do five things, I want the first or second thing on their list to be real estate because I want to make sure they know what they're doing. Most attorneys, because you're not going to court, you're not, you know, most transactions go through relatively smoothly. So there's not a lot of work to be done. So most attorneys feel like they can just do it, even if they're not an ex, quote unquote, expert in it. Um, you want to make sure you're getting an expert in. One more. Does Ulster Savings do refinancing or mortgages to have lower monthly payments after, say, five years? So there's no limit on when you can refinance. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, obviously rates, rates, OK, rates are not high for somebody like me that's been in this business forever because I've seen rates in the tens before. OK, so for me, that's not high. Now it's high for the last whatever, 20 years, but it's not high historically. Um, so, yes, if you buy a house now. Uh, if rates fell down, if you close today and the rate fell down to 4%, 5% in August and you wanted to refinance, we could absolutely take a look at it then. Not a problem. There is no inherent waiting period if all you're doing is looking to refinance to get a better rate. If you're looking to get cash out of your house and do some repairs and stuff, you may have to wait a little longer for that. Again, depends on the program, but we have some different options on that. All right. 
Uh, Rich. Or for got another one that just came in. Well, let me uh, let me see if we have anything with our live crew here. Nope, nope. Uh, we're, we're nothing. Nothing left here. Then everybody's set here. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming, uh, Mike. What else we got there? For the purposes of household income, would you include the income of a long-term partner that you aren't married to? Okay. Uh, good question. Depends. So, okay. Uh, married or not is inconsequential. Okay. Uh, we can have uh, we can have short-term partners. I don't necessarily recommend <laughs> recommend that if you're buying a house together. I hope you're long-term. But we can have short-term partners, long-term partners, spouses. You can have parent and child. We can have friends, whatever. For that, it really doesn't matter. Uh, there are some programs, some of these programs that we talked about, like some of the grant programs, some of the zero down payment programs. One of the things that they're going to be looking at is household income. So even if the person, if the person lives in the house, say there's just to use an easy example, there's uh, there's there's spouses. OK, so there's two spouses on the loan. They file a joint tax return and all that. One spouse is on the loan. One spouse is not on the loan. Because we know that there's another person that's going to be living in the house, their income might be taken into account for purposes of these credit limits, so uh, of these income limits. So let's say the income limit for a certain grant, you can't make more than $75,000 for a household in order to qualify for this grant. You make $50,000. Great. We've got plenty of room. You qualify for the house. That's fine. We find out there's another person over 18 that's going to be living into the house. Again, could be spouse, could be grandma, could be whatever. OK, we need to get proof of their income. And if their combined incomes put you over that seventy five thousand dollar limit, now maybe you don't qualify for that grant. OK, so there's qualifying for the loan and then there's compliance qualifications. There's two different calculations that might be done on some of these programs. So that's where household income comes. But in terms of who can you have as an applicant, relationship itself really doesn't matter. OK. If you refinance, do you still have to pay closing costs even though it's your house? Uh, generally, yes. I'm not going to say it depends on that. There's there's some costs. It may not be, generally, it's not going to be as high as it was originally, but there's some costs that are just uh, nature of the beast that, again, we are going to get charged, so we're going to charge them. Um, and then there's, there's some bank fees that are involved in that. But yes, so that's something we got to take a look at. So let's say uh, just to use a, an example, you you buy a house today and your rate is 7%, just to use an easy number. I'm not saying that's where rates are. And rates go down to 6.75. Should you run out and refinance? Probably not, because if you're going to have a couple thousand dollars in fees and it's only going to save you $20 a month to get that lower rate, then maybe that doesn't make sense. Okay. But if the rate comes down to 5% and you're going to save $700 a month, if it costs you, you know, if it costs you 3,500 in fees and you're going to make that money back over seven months, well, then big deal, right? You definitely would want to do that. So um, when it comes to that, we just, there's no magic to it. You just, we do the math and present it out to you and say, okay, here's what it is. It's going to cost you this much, but you're going to save this much. So it's going to take you X number of months to recoup your costs. If you'd like to move forward, I'm happy to work with you. If you don't, let's revisit it again when rates come down again. It's That's all that it is, too. Okay. When should I apply for the Homebuyer Dream Program, and how can I apply? Okay. So you can't apply for that. That's something that we do on your behalf. Uh, the other grants, you can go, like I said, you can talk to housing agencies and do your research online. The Home Buyer Dream specifically is something that we have to do, and we can't apply to it until we have a full package, all your income, we've run your credit, you have a signed contract. Okay, we have to have a signed contract. So you have to be serious about moving forward. Once we have a signed contract, then we can apply for that uh, for that grant. And as long as you're, you know, again, there's a spot available and you are approved for it then we can have it locked up for you, okay? All right, and we are- Seems to be it. it. All right, great. Well, again, I thank you everybody for joining us. I know it was a long time. I apologize for the technical difficulties up front. Hopefully you got some, uh, you know, you really found some value out of what we did here. I wanna thank uh, Mike and Rich for jumping on with me as well and helping out with taking questions and helping to uh, to facilitate and move things along here. 
Uh, when you are ready to move forward, you can go ahead and give us a call at 338-6322. That's an 845 number. Um, and our receptionist can put you through. You can go out to our website at ulcersavings.com. You can pick your uh, your loan officer that you want to work with from there. Again, I, I certainly suggest either Mike or Rich since they've been online. If you're already working with somebody, that's fine. Stick with them. All of our people are good. Um, they won't have any, you know, you won't have any issues with any, you shouldn't have any issues with any of our people. So uh, again, if you want to give us some feedback, make sure you email us to get that certificate. If you don't email us, we're not going to be able to get that certificate out to spring training to dreams happen at Ulster.com. Give us some feedback, be gentle. And uh, I thank you very much, everybody. And we look forward to helping you get the uh, home of your dreams. Have a great rest of your evening and a great night.